I would like to invite you on a special journey. A journey of exploration to discover the splendor, to feel the excitement, and to experience the wonders of painting outdoors. In one of America's most stunning locations, Mount Shasta. A three-day journey that will change your art forever. This spring I invite you to the Grandview Ranch and see for yourself what a weekend can do to transform your paintings. Everything you need to know is on our website www.stephenbauman.com So we had a talk about artist burnout last week and I can't tell you how many emails I have gotten saying thank God you addressed that. And I think you guys had some breakthroughs this weekend too with that. And so Mercedes was saying, what did you say when we had that conversation? Because you were kind of responsible for that whole conversation. Because you came in and you said, oh, I'm just so burned out. I don't know what to do. Molly was also kind of responsible. But anyway, thank God, because I have gotten so many emails from people who feel the same way. So you're not alone. <laughs> I should share some of these emails that you, you spurred on. It was like perfect. And then I sent out my campfire chat. Yes. And with the campfire chat, that also uh, stimulated a lot of people like, oh my God, you must have written that just for me. <laughs> yes, I did. I wrote just for you. There's this feeling that there's an energy out there. And you hear a lot of people that the law of attraction. So if you're usually in a down mood and you're having a pity party, and you're by yourself and you're like, uh, oh. and then before you know it, the person who you want least to call is the other person in your life that is having the same pity party. And it's like all of a sudden you think the whole world is down and, and drab. What you want to do is you want to kind of get that, that's a state of mind and that's perfect. But there's this law of attraction that happens. And when all of a sudden you start getting inspired, you start attracting people and so what happened this week with you, with that way? I had a window washer come over to wash the windows in the house I was... A window sitting. washer? A window washer. Just yes. somebody just, hey, come over, I wash my windows? I know him. He was just a nice little kind of round man. And he <laughs> was, seemed kind of shy. And we were down in the studio looking at the windows down there. And he said, oh, did you paint those? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he was saying, oh, I like that cat and whatever. And he said... I'm a photographer myself, and ah. what a photographer he is. So even though I felt free to jump into painting, I didn't have anything in mind particularly. So Roland, who's an excellent window washer by the way, um, sent me a whole bunch of his photographs. I mean all sorts of things uh -huh. from Fort Bragg Botanical Garden, animals, um, and he really has an artistic way with painting, mm -hmm. with photography. I mean he's he crops it well. So he sent me a load of pictures, lots of them that I'd like to paint. So it was sort of like I attracted my muse back. So you got your muse back. Yeah. And the thing is what's awesome now is that you actually have a partner in crime. Because now he's going to start doing some beautiful, wonderful photographs for you. You're now inspired because, you know, you've been kind of doing dog portraits and cat portraits for a couple of years now and you're, you're, I mean, you're a master at that. Part of what we want to do is try to expand your horizon. One of them is go big because you always work so small. And so you've kind of stepped it up a bit, just a bit. I mean, when we won, we want to go really big. You know, I want to see you get something you can't get in your car. I want to dotty eyes me. I want to like, yeah. <laughs> But so this guy brings you some photographs and apparently they inspired you enough that you might take on doing some landscapes and things like that. Yeah. So that's how it happens. It's just really amazing. Now, it's like a lot of people that want to get into a gallery. But the first thing they say to themselves is, oh no, I got to wait till my work's better. I mean, literally, it's like, why aren't you in a gallery? 
Yeah. You're waiting for your paintings to get better. Well, and also to have a collection that's yeah. uniform, which I'm kind of all over the map. That's another thing. Oh, I can't possibly do that. I got away from my collection. A collection of what? You don't know, do you? What does that collection look like? It's a, it's a blur when I think about it. It's a blur when you think about it. Yeah. So the whole idea of even getting a collection together and getting into a gallery is... It's hard. It's a blur. Yeah. Because you haven't really focused in. Continuity. Yeah. Do you think galleries really want continuity? I don't know whether they do or not. There's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of talk about it. And of course, every time when you read something or listen to somebody on the internet, they say, well, if you're going to approach a gallery, you have to have continuity. You have to have a collection of your work. You have to have a website that's up and running that looks like you've been doing and thinking this through for years. You need to know how to market yourself. Oh my God, you're never going to get into a gallery. That's the conversation you have with yourself, and then you wonder why you're not in a gallery. She's running. And the thing is, you're talented. You should be in a gallery. How many times have you walked around in a gallery and, you, and your husband says, you know what, your paintings are better than this stuff that's in here? Mm -hmm. All of you. How many times have you walked into galleries and you go, oh man, I can't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> like, why aren't you in a gallery? That's the conversation we have with ourselves, that law of attraction. If you're not inspired, what do you think you're going to attract? More not inspired. <laughs> you're going to have that person who sits on the phone and talks to you for hours. And all she does is talk about herself and how miserable she is. And you're sitting there going, oh man, if you want to know misery, you should hear my story. But you're not going to burden her with that. <laughs> but if you actually started thinking about the possibility of being in a gallery, and you could clearly say, you know what? I know my work's not there yet, but what is there? Do you know when you certain, reach a certain point with your painting, your idea of what there is all of a sudden gets higher? And the paintings you did last year that your husband said, oh, your paintings are better than anything in this gallery, right? Are now better than they were. In fact, was he was telling you that, you're right now actually producing that quality of work. You've gotten better. But now you're, you're setting your bar even higher. See how ridiculously crazy that is to run? You never can get there. Yeah. Of course, then what we do is we don't take the time to actually even approach a gallery. What does a gallery want? It's so intimidating. I know. You walk in there, there's some guy sitting there in the corner, usually reading some magazine. <laughs> and he looks up over his glasses and you walk in and you're like, Oh. <laughs> it's like walking to God, right? And that the, from the front door to his table is so far away that you decide to kind of skirt around the gallery acting like you're just somebody just, just looking, <laughs> just looking. Right? And then you kind of come in and then the phone rings and he's on and go, oh good, now I can go. Yeah, so then you sneak out the back door somewhere. Or you hide in the bathroom going, what was I thinking? <laughs> but you know, gallery owners, a lot of them have a big ego. Okay, so a lot of them are like, oh, well, we only accept per But the reality is, is that gallery owners, they are like any other store. And so they're like a gift shop. And you don't think when the be Beanie Baby craze was hot, remember Beanie Babies? <laughs> that you don't think that every store in America wanted to have Beanie Babies. And so if you walked in and said, I'm selling Beanie Babies, they would yank them from your hands, even though the whole thing wasn't anything except kind of a big scam, right? I have boxes of them, yeah. $500 for, for, you know, bear, hippie bear or whatever like that, and you, you know. So you spend $500 and now you can't give them away. Nobody wants them because they're all over the place. People trying to impress me would go out and spend $100 to get them. Princess bear, you know, back in years ago. Oh, my godson. My godson thought I was a god. He was four and five, which is, you know, like, mm -hmm. and next to the, one of the galleries that I owned, next door was a gift shop that was one of the reps for Beanie Babies. And she would literally just hand over 
the newest ones to me and I pay just retail for them, not the high. So he was always getting the hot Beanie Baby that what everybody wanted. He had, he had a whole room full of Beanie Babies and they only cost me $48, you know. But the, some of them were going four or 500 and he could barely speak when he was that young. And he'd go, Godfather, thank you so much. He goes, you know how much that's worth? <laughs> you knew numbers. Of course I did. So anyway, he's grown up now, he's 22, and he's not collecting Beanie Babies anymore. But anyway. How old was he when he became your godson? Oh, he was born that way. Yeah, the time he was born. Can you imagine somebody actually choosing me as a godfather? Ooh. Of course. I'd have to trust, I'd have to like. Anyway, I digress. So anyway, so the key to it is that you're, you're ready at any time. And we kind of feel that going to the gallery is like a card that we have to wait to play. It's kind of like having a secret hand. Oh no, I can't go to that gallery owner right now because I'm not good enough yet. But you don't know that, it's a conversation in your head. And, and so a lot of people actually ask me about galleries and co-ops and stuff. I usually recommend not to go into a co-op situation. In fact, one of my phone coaching people who I coach, she said, oh, she was offered an opportunity to go to a gallery which was three hours or two hours away from her. And the only option is that she needs to spend one day a month to sit there. And I said, oh, that sounds like a co-op because usually they'll ask you to do that. And that's okay, but think about that. The problem with going to a co-op gallery is that they ask every artist, if you've got 20, 25 artists, everybody sits a day. So you get your paintings on the wall, which is good because then you can put that on your bio. I'm at so-and-so gallery by the sea. So you have that and it's worth something. And if you're there in town, it's fine. But realize what's going to happen is that every day you've got another person watching the gallery. And every day that person has got their paintings in the gallery. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes in and says, oh, I'm looking for a painting, what painting do you think they're excited they about selling? <laughs> you know, so the chances of you selling a painting most likely would be the one day that you are there because you're more interested in selling your painting that day than somebody else's painting. Especially when it costs you $100 a month. You want to like make some money out of that. So normally co-op galleries are not good. You're at the, at the, the, and a lot of people don't know how to sell. I mean, one reason why artists go into, into galleries is because they're really business, bet, poor bet business people. So they think, just give it to somebody else. I can't sell my paintings. And that's the truth. It's hard to sell your paintings. It's a separate business than you. So you go into a gallery and you go, you know, I'm so-and-so, you introduce yourself, you show your portfolio. And the guy will sit there and they'll tell one thing. One, they go, I don't make those decisions. Somebody else does. And a lot of times those people can actually hand your portfolio to those people. And sometimes galleries have this system of, well, you have to send it in and then, you know, because they're too afraid to tell you that they don't like your work. So you have to kind of like fill out these forms and then, you know, go on every, the third Thursday of the month that starts with an R and, <laughs> and submit your work. And then we have a, a committee that looks at your work. And then we decide out of that committee, and it's like, that's just bull. They've got an owner that decides whether or not he can make money off of you or not. And if you walk in there and they look at your work and say, you know what, there's someone here to buy that stuff, they'll buy it. Do you think if you're like a really great painter and you can make a lot of money with the things yourself, they're going to say, no, go home and fill out this form? No, they're going to go, when can you bring work in? And it's really surprising. A lot of the people who I work with on the phone, I tell them, okay, go to town and get a gallery. And I've had some artists actually just go into a major city, walk into a gallery, and present their work because I told them to. And you know what happened? The gallery said yes. And it's better to go in by yourself and walk into the gallery than it is to try to approach them otherwise. You know, the closest gallery we have is Sacramento, that's decent. Well, you may have to go to Sacramento. You may have to go to Portland. You may have to go to Seattle. You may have to go to San Francisco. Is there one and, you, in yeah. and you walk into a gallery and you ha if you've got work that's worth what they want, if you look around and say, wow, that's something like Mendocino, if there's a gallery in Mendocino, walk in there. If you've got some motion scenes, walk in there and say, here it is, that, that, guy, that gallery in Sedona. Remember they said that they might be interested in your work? Well, you know, if you would have walked in at that day and said, here's my work, and they go, well, let's see some, some paintings, and you show them two. They can tell from those two whether or not you're qualified to be in there. And if they love your work, they can gauge it from those two. 
they don't have to see a collection. Now, if they say, oh, no, 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 like these, that gallery said, no, right? Now, all of a sudden, you think, oh, well, I just blew my wad. I, you know, I just, I'm not going to be able to, to go there again. It's like, no. You say, thank you. Would you mind if I show you next year? You come in. If not, don't even show, because if you all of a sudden become red hot next year, he's going to go, oh, so what's new? And say, here's my new work. And so oftentimes the no, it just leads to an, a yes at some point. Think about how you don't want to be in a gallery that everybody in that town paints horribly by our standards. Okay, so whatever horrible is, you know, so let's just say everybody in town just is worse than the, what you think horrible is. Nobody's horrible, right? Everybody paints great. They paint however they are, but let's just say the town just learned how to paint. And everybody in that town is local, but they don't know how to paint, and a gallery opens up. And you come in and you actually know how to paint an ocean scene. Like, and they'll look at you think, oh, no, 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 we can't sell this stuff, but it doesn't matter because they're all local artists. It's like, no, they'd rather have good paintings than having local artists anytime, regardless of that. So you just go, oh, really, can I show you my work anyway? If you've got work that they think they can sell and it's, it's a cut above what's doing locally, they'd be stupid not to take your work. If they don't take your work and you're painting better than what's in the gallery, then you don't want to be in that gallery. Because they're looking at, oh, I've got to have local work over actually making sales. And so it's a product. And unfortunately, painting is a product. It's a product. And don't do a consignment. And don't, well, no, everybody does a consignment. You have to do consignments. I know they're horrible, but that's how galleries operate. Lose some and stab you in the back. And... Oh, not all galleries. <laughs> now, it's not like the olden days where artists would put their paintings in and they would do all the marketing. You know what art, you know what art galleries really want? What galleries actually want? Yeah, they want paintings that sell. But you know what galleries really want? They want to see artists that know how to market themselves. Because the reality is, is that galleries no longer market artists. And part of it is because they don't know how. They don't know how to market a, an artist. If a really great artist walked into a gallery, they have no idea what to do with them. They hope that you have a good marketing. So they want to see, first thing they're going to see, how many shows you've been in. And so you need to start submitting into all those online shows, like even here, you know, submit here. It's another line, another line, another line, another line. So they like that line full. They're, most of them wouldn't even read those, those shows and galleries. They don't care. They just like a lot of text in there. And they won't check to see if they're real or not, but they like that box text. So that's something you want to kind of consider. And so you start entering into those shows, whatever show you're in, you fill a line. It doesn't matter if you want or not, it just fills in a line, so it looks busy. So they want to see that. They want to see you, if you have a website, and on that website, they want to see how many people do you have? How many people are on your mailing list? A lot of galleries have the goal to sit and say, okay, well, give us your mailing list so that we can notify everybody that you're having a show. But a lot of galleries don't even put shows together because they don't want to invest any money into you. So if you end up having a, a good mailing list, which a lot of artists don't even bother collecting, and that's really the key to becoming an artist is having a good collection. The business of art is complex. But if you can do it, if you can get into galleries, if you have a couple of magazine articles, they're interested. If your work looks like, they'll overlook that if you know how to market yourself, if you can sell it. I'm amazed at what artists cross my, what artists cross my, my way. And I'm like going and they go, oh, yeah, you know how much I'm, I'm like going, how much? There's an artist, I think, Remember that one artist that I said today uh -huh. that paints that way, paints mm -hmm. those trees and stuff? Yeah. She makes, from, from what I hear, about $150,000 a year Ow. on painting like that. Wow. We won't mention what the subject matter is because it's going to give it away. And, you know, and they're big. They're big wall paintings, right? And she sells them in Santa Fe. They're wretched. <laughs> <laughs> they're horrible. They're just horrible. There's no essence of lights and shadows and composition. They're just that. They're just, they're, they're horrible. She makes tons of money. So much so that her husband handles her work. So he doesn't work either. 
So he's like a rep, well, but he's got like galleries and then, okay. yeah, so, so anyway, so, so you're the worst judge of your own painting. I, what I would say, if you want to get into a gallery, that'd be great. If you want to break your feeling that you want to be inspired, getting into a gallery is being inspired. Sharing your work is inspired. That's why we want to share it. Most people quit painting because they have too many paintings. Mm -hmm. And it's true. You don't want to be somebody like that. Yes? You say manage and promote your work. Can you hire that then and give them a percentage? Yeah, you can, but there's very few people that do that. I don't know why, but you know, art reps, one of my students, she's, she's uh, always listening to marketing things on YouTube. And for 10 years, I've been coaching her in classes and stuff. And for 10 years, we've been talking about marketing her work. And for 10 years, we're still talking about marketing her work. Nothing gets marketed, but we still talk about it. And finally, I said, you know what? I said, you're horrible at marketing. Yeah. You're, you need to find somebody else to do it for you. And I said, let's face it. In 10 years, you've been waiting for the perfect opportunity. You've been waiting for your paintings to, to, to get to a certain quality. You've been waiting to set up a website. You've been waiting, 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 waiting. And in 10 years, you're still waiting. And I said, basically the problem is you're not very good at selling your own work and you really need to find somebody who does that better. And so find a gallery that does that. And if you have to give them 50%, which is a gallery's commission, be happy to do that because you're not selling anything on your own. And at least if you go into a gallery, there's people walking in that might buy your painting or at least get to read about you. But the pizza man's not gonna show up. But we talked about this law of attraction. You gotta dream it, you gotta visualize it, you gotta, you gotta dream it, even like the quality of your work. And when all of a sudden you broke out of your, your, your thing about being stuck and bored and tired, and I said, don't do that anymore. All of a sudden the window washer looks into your house and goes, hey, you're an artist, how cool, so am I. And you start sharing, and all of a sudden now you have a newfound friend. Your husband's going to wonder who's this guy stalking you in your, in your house. So, so, but the thing is, nothing ever hurts to get out there and introduce yourself. Nothing ever hurts to try to change a new possibility for yourself. And first, you've got to imagine yourself having a possibility. And I know that when Molly and I were sitting there talking, Molly came to me and she goes, what do you think about having a show here? And I said, I think it'd be great. But see, at that point, she visualized what that would happen. And she all of a sudden sensed that there was a possibility for that. And I mean, within that little tiny space, Ray came over to her and said, would you like to have a show here? You know, it was actually just like that. But she actually at that point made that idea so real that that was possible, that all of a sudden a door opened and it came in. So the reason why you're not growing as an artist, the reason why you're not getting into a gallery. It's because you're not opening up that possibility of that happening. You have some rooted thing that says, oh no, not me, I'm not ready. And if you just eliminate that, just like that window washer showing up, all of a sudden things start to flow in. My phone coaching is crazy. It's crazy. I have so many people calling for coaching, but it's just in my head, I just put it out there that I want to coach the world. I want people to call me. And whenever I sit and, and just think about, oh, I want to open up in more time for, for, so I can help people paint, all of a sudden I get a phone call, then two and three. And I can just open up a day and I won't get any phone calls for a long time and I'll just open up a day and within two days it's full. It starts at 4.30 in the morning. It's like, but I love it. People go, how can you get up at 4.30 in the morning and be a good coach and then come here to class and be a good coach? And I go, because I love the people I coach. And some of them have never painted before, ever. They've never painted before and they're just awesome because they want to. Usually the people that call me are, are ready for coaching. Just like people who come in to ask for classes, they're ready for classes. So usually coachable people show up. You know, other people are still looking on YouTube for free stuff, and I think they're going to find it. But the people who call me 
are a special kind of people that say, okay, I need help. I need to get to where I want to go. I'm not going to figure it out that way. And so they call me and um, they're awesome people, just like this class. Is there anybody in this class you don't like? There's a certain quality of people that, that show up and my phone is like that. So it'd be like every one of you calling me every half hour. And so it's like, hey, Lania, hey, Dottie, hey, Molly. It's like when Molly calls me, I'm like, oh, God, Molly's calling me. She never calls. I, can't, I know, but when you do, it's like a special treat. And so when these people call me, I'm excited, even at 4.30 in the morning. And the people are just wonderful. I just, I love them. I love them, I love them, I love them. There's just a certain kind of people there. But anyway, so get over it if you're not, if you're just... Figure out a way to get over it. Change your subject, change your, your focus, change your life. Imagine what artist you can be. Imagine big, huge, bold paintings painted with your, your feet if you have to. Try to stimulate yourself out of being stuck and bored. And if, the, if you're there but you're not moving forward, imagine for yourself the possibility of being in a gallery. Approach a gallery once, twice, three times. I know artists that just nag galleries to death and they go, oh, I'll hang you in the bathroom. It's like, thank you. At least you got a foot in the door, right? That might be the best place. That might be the, you got a captive audience, yes. So can you hang it in, I notice your bathroom doesn't have a painting, can I put, the, put one there? Um, a lot of galleries will say yes to almost everybody. And the problem with that is they're just getting a huge inventory. They might be really good at selling, but you may not be found in that noise. So you kind of have to choose what gallery you want. So the gallery that you may want to be in might not be the one to think about it. But what I would suggest to do is, is that law of attraction. And these are the rules for that. Is that basically, if you decide that I want to, you want to do something in art, first thing, write, write down somewhere that you're going to read this three times a day. Just put it on a card. And it works. I don't know how it does, but it works. But you've got to be conscious of this. So three times a day you're going to read this card. And one of the things could be, I want to be in a gallery, but be really specific. Say, I want to be like in Trailside Gallery in, in uh, Wyoming. Number two, you have to look at that thing three times a day. So what you may want to do is do a couple cards. One for your easel, one for your dashboard in your car, and one on your refrigerator. And you just consciously go and take a look at that. So that's the first thing you want to do. The second thing that you want to do Oh, well, that second thing you want to do is look at it two or three times. And then the third thing what you want to do is not tell anybody you're doing it. Because there are so many naysayers and negative people. When you start telling the world what you want to do with your life, all of a sudden that aunt that you hate that sits on the phone and talks to you all the time, all of a sudden calls you and says, Fred, that your uncle called me and she said that Agnes told her that you're planning on becoming an artist in the gallery. And remember when you were four, I told you that was a stupid idea? Well, I still think it's a stupid idea. You were told at an early age that being an artist was stupid and dumb. Go get a real job. And most people believe that still. I can't tell you. The first thing I want to do with phone coaching, the first thing I tell them is, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And do you know how weird that is telling somebody who's 60? And they, they stop for a second, they go, oh my God, nobody's asked me that since I was four. And I go, and what did you tell them? They said, I wanted to be an artist. And what did your parents say? They said, no, be, you're stupid. And they've been, hell, they've been holding that ever since their life. So you wonder why they're not artists now. They still subconsciously believe the story that was told to them when they were four. Most of the time you're being stopped by that. That's one reason why you don't walk into a gallery and show your work. Because you believe that story that you're not going to be an artist, it's stupid. It's a dream. Get over it. Stop it. I know I'm picking on you, but I have to have somebody in the room. This is, this is the way I believe. It's like, you know, you have a website. Your website is your portfolio. And so if you want to be a professional artist, you have to have a website. And a question. That's just it. The first thing I do with my coaching students is have a website. Because if you walk into a gallery, uh, so when you walk into a gallery, they'll say, what's your website? And the thing is, the problem with that is that they'll take it down and they'll say, well, I'll look at it when I have more time, but they don't. And you think That's that they'll... The iPad comes out. Yeah. Well, you know, the problem is with it. 
Do you know do you know what happens when you walk in with an iPad and, and you know you have that? The artist immediately and I see that sometimes like today we had somebody come in for, you know, and he opens up he's carrying his iPad and oh my god, it's like I get I get cold fever because I'm gonna be stuck <laughs> looking at all of their pictures of everything in the world and then their paintings scattered in between that. It's like ah and then if you hate their painting you can't get away from it. It's like, ah, you know, but they have to be polite, so they have to kind of go slowly. But the thing is, they're stuck there in this ever loop of, but the thing is, what you want to do if you're going to go physically in is that you do it the old fashioned way. You know, if you want to make an, an uh, uh, impress somebody nowadays, like a gallery, you send them a handwritten note because everybody else does computer generated stuff. So you do a handwritten note and then you walk in with an old fashioned portfolio. Leather bound on two sides, eight or ten nice plastic sleeves, eight or ten well documented photos of your paintings. <coughs> Beautifully presented. One page your painting, the other side an explanation of what it is, what gallery it is. Next page. And you only need eight or ten. Most galleries can tell within three paintings whether or not you're valuable. And the thing is, you might think a gallery wants ocean scenes, but they probably have everybody who walks in thinking that they want an ocean scene, and they'd give anything for a wildlife painter. Because they have people who come in that don't like ocean scenes, but they want a wildlife painting. So should your portfolio be a sampling across the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just you don't need a collection. Because the painting that you think that you want to paint, they might look there and go, well, what about these paintings? And you go, well, that's actually the stuff I like to do, the plain air stuff. But I thought you wanted ocean scenes. And you go, well, wait a minute here. So you give them a kind of thing. But the thing is, when you walk in and, and a gallery owner can say yay or nay within two minutes or a minute or 30 seconds, even 10 seconds, they're done with you. They don't have to look you up, they don't have to contact you, they don't have all that. And the problem is if you wait for them to contact you, right an hour later there's going to be another artist in that gallery who's got a portfolio. And they're going to say, here, take a look at my work real quick. And if they're excited, they write up right then. Because they're not going to send you home if they love your work, regardless of how you present it. But just be sure you put on a clean shirt and nice pants and you smell good. <laughs> But they'll even buy, they'll even take you on if you smell bad. They don't care, they want product. Now, you know? how many galleries take paintings and then uh, frame them? No, I never expect a, a gallery to frame your paintings, that's just awful. Because I've seen some where, like uh, some peasant in Mexico is doing something really unusual and he brings these un framework there, they frame it, they do all the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and galleries, a lot of galleries have horrible taste in framing, they don't understand. We're going we're gonna to have a conversation in the next couple of weeks about framing because I have an awesome framer. But you should always be in charge of framing. And the reason why you frame is because most people have horrible homes and, and horrible colors on their walls. <laughs> and so if you want to protect your painting, you want to put a barrier between your painting and their awful taste. <laughs> So you need a frame that's wide enough so that it doesn't intrude in your painting. So a lot of times your frames need to be, and a lot of times galleries will sit there and go, oh, just pick up a pretty little, if you've got a little red house in there, they'll say, oh, get a little bit of red frame in there, it pulls out the house, isn't that pretty? So like, that's not what a painting is, it's not about the house at all, it's about what light, right? So you want a painting that actually enhances the light. So you want something that buffs these beige walls or gray or whatever taste they have. Okay, so then, and then you also have to frame it to, to your clients. So if your clients are wealthy, they've got stickly furniture. And if they stick a driftwood frame around your painting, you can sit there in the gallery forever wondering why your painting doesn't sell for $5,000. And it's because somebody who has $5,000 to buy your painting doesn't hang driftwood above <laughs> stickly. You have to have that, that buffer there. And then you put that buffer whatever it costs you into the price of the, your painting. Because the people who are buying your painting, chances are they're buying it because it matches their house. So you want a, you want a buffer from bad taste and then you want something that matches your, your, your painting. Now the key to it is that you want to have high quality frames which cost you money. And if you're painting 16 by 20, 18 by 24, buy some expensive frames. Go to the framer I love, Masterworks Frames, which I just love. I love working with them because I just give them an idea and they give exactly what I want and you know, then they send me a bill afterwards. They're wonderful. Can you send a picture of the painting you want to frame? 
Yeah, you can do that. They'll send you. But the thing is, I kind of verbally tell them what I want, and they do even better than normally. So Masterworks Frames is one that I work with. But see, this company, it's good to work that way, because you can go into a, a framer like Sherry, and they've got molding, and you can go that way. But it's always cut in the corners. Ma uh, there are really custom framers will actually build the frame, and then they put the finish on it. And so the, so the frame is one solid piece of furniture all the way around. That's a sign of a quality frame. And then you go and get a quality name tag, like a museum. You want to sell your work, you make it look like a museum piece, because even if people don't have money, they wish they had. And they want their friends to be impressed. And if you just get this little rinky-dink, tiny little frame around their frame, they're not going to impress their friends. It's like, oh yeah, well, it looks like you went to the local thing. But if you get a painting that has a frame on it that's gorgeous and it's got a real name tag like you see in the museum, people are going to go, whoa, they're impressed. It's amazing what an investment is. But you can't just do those little brass, those little brass um, things. So we'll talk about framing in the future. Anyway, I digress. The reason why you're stopped the reason why you're not getting anywhere with your art is that you're not creating a possibility for yourself to become a great artist. What you want to do is kind of imagine what your work would look like. You want to imagine that it is possible because there are people that are creating their careers left and right of you that believe that they're actually artists. Dress like one. Market yourself like one. Make phone calls. Send your paintings to companies that no artists normally don't send to. One of my students did uh, a seasoning for a seafood company, and it was just happened to be on the, the label. I said, send that to that company. And she did. And it's in the final review in corporate because they're thinking about doing an ad campaign with it. I was in People Magazine when I was 18. People Magazine. Do you know how many people would give their eye teeth to have People Magazine call you and say, we'd like to do an article on you? I waited by the phone all my life for them to call me. All 18 years. All 18 years. <laughs> do you think I showed up anywhere that People Magazine would say, hey, let's do an article on this young artist? No. I sent the editor an article on me saying, I think you should have an article on me in People Magazine. <laughs> and they called me up and they did an article. They flew somebody out to do the writing on it. That article in People Magazine spared on a television show in New York on children doing magnificent stuff. Well, I didn't send it. I just sent a letter to the editor. See? It's like, but when you're 18, you, you're not afraid of doing that. The People Magazine article that I sent to them or to pitch me had to do with kind of what they were looking for at the time. And so I ended up, of all things, in John Lennon's issue. So it's a purple issue with John Lennon on the cover. It's actually the most sold People Magazine ever. And it was a John Lennon issue. And if you look in there, you'll actually see an article of me. So if you have that article floating around, you actually, I've got big hair. I look like Rob Ross. <laughs> If you'd like to take your painting to the next level, regardless at whatever level you are, please feel free to contact me personally at 415-606-9074. Join us on a three-day experience that will rediscover and rekindle your passion and desire for painting outdoors. Everything you need to know is on our website, www stephanbauman.com Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at the Grandview by calling 1-800-511-1337. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. 
There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject.